Sometimes we look back to go ahead. Only a decade or so ago, there was a car, a car that gained such wide acceptance that it became a classic in its own time. When the Ford people were ready to produce a new kind of car, a car of tomorrow that was conceived to be the finest in the world, it had an enviable reputation before it was born because they called it the Continental. Great new engineering in power and construction were worked out. The problem was this, how to create a new Continental with the rakish charm of the classic and still have an automobile to inspire future stylists for years to come. The design went through development stages. Finally, one that captured the best of everything emerged. Sixteen thousand four hundred Michigan Avenue. Here took place a significant development in automotive history. On August 20, 1952, two men drove up to these old buildings. They were looking for a place to go to work on an idea. William Clay Ford already had been thinking about the idea for two years. He and an automotive engineer were looking for a building to set up a new organization. It had all begun back in 1939, when Edsel Ford, Bill's father, had designed a very special car. At first, it was not intended to be manufactured and sold. It was built as Edsel Ford's personal automobile. It was called the Lincoln Continental. It became a classic in its own time. Yet in all, only 5,322 were ever built. With the tremendous demand for volume-produced automobiles after World War II, manufacture of the Continental was suspended in 1948. But it never really passed from the scene. Even fan clubs of Lincoln Continental owners were organized, and people kept asking, when are they going to start making the Continental again? Now, in 1952, the work was actually underway in the gymnasium of the old schoolhouse. There were many questions. How should this car look? Should it resemble the old Continental? Or should it be a wholly new conception? Two points were clear. It must recapture the crisp styling of the old Continental. It must take its place at the head of an established family of fine cars. Into this new frame, a special passenger compartment was engineered with a new low roof line, but with the same amount of room inside. But when they finished this basic engineering, they had only begun. Now, they had to style it, design a new shape into which this new engineering package would fit. Bill Ford had a broad styling concept, which he called modern formal. There was still more than a year ahead of exploring on this alone. Sometimes they thought they had it. And then they knew they didn't. finest car in the world didn't come overnight. By the end of 1952, they had come to the basic agreement, a decision on the general overall proportions of this new Continental. To introduce the element of competition, a styling assignment on the new car was given to four outside automotive designers who would come up with independent ideas. 
All the designs had to conform to a grid, laid out like a transparent checkerboard. Artist drawings can often be deceptive. The grid ensured that approved specifications were met. And all the renderings were to be in the same color, Prussian blue, so that all the pictures could be compared objectively. In the meantime, the division's own stylists were coming up with their version. It would be a fair and open competition. May 5th, 1953. When everything was set, the members of a special products committee were brought in one by one to make their decision. Each was to choose by number the design he thought was the right one. design would they select? It was a great moment for Bill Ford's group when the results were in. The design they had created was the final choice. This was the one management decided to bet on. It was a multi-million dollar gamble. But was this to be the continental of tomorrow? Not by quite a bit, but it was a solid beginning. At the old school buildings, there was still plenty of midnight oil to be burned before the design would be completed. But now they could at least begin to think ahead to the problems of manufacture, of tooling and production. There were new questions now. Questions on construction of a plant in which to build this car on a virtually custom basis. That planning could now get underway while further refinements of design were plotted, sketched out, discarded, or adopted. While scale models were built and studied and modified, while full-size clay and plaster continentals were shaped and reshaped to achieve what the engineers and stylists wanted, September 29, 1953. It was as a plaster car that the new Continental received final approval. But a mock-up like this is really only a kind of three-dimensional picture. No drive it and see it the way it would really come to life, in motion. Based on what was decided about it in lifeless plaster, a copy in metal was the final step. This meant more months of planning and detail work. It would be impossible to say just what day or what hour this new car was actually born because it came to life a little at a time during the intensive effort of two years. But as good a day as any was December 24, 1954, the day before Christmas. Handmade prototype was at last ready for its trial run. There came the instant when the wheels turned under power for the first time. Everything that had gone before was preparation. This was the beginning for Continental Mark II. Of course, 
course, there was a tremendous amount of work to do yet before it could be manufactured on an assembly line. It would have to go through a complete and tough test pattern. Check its performance in desert heat. And under winter conditions that were more severe than any place on Earth. It ran for weeks on durability runs without ever stopping except for gas and oil. And in a blackout disguise, it traveled from coast to coast before final approval was given. And it was checked again and again for style. Photographed and re-photographed against all kinds of backgrounds. For engineers and stylists knew that in creating this new car, they had also created a new personality in a family of automobiles. But before the first future owner could take delivery, there were a few thousand details involved in getting production underway. A new car, a new company division. Now, a whole new plant to be built. And production in that new plant on the expressway just out of Dearborn is unlike any other production operation in the automobile industry. Relatively few cars are finished each day. Each individual engine is checked out on the dynamometer. Every body is first assembled and checked then taken apart, numbered, and the sections painted as a set assigned to one particular car. A painstaking painting process with four double coats of paint. Each double coat is sanded and baked before the next is applied. Wheel covers are hand assembled rather than welded producing a superior chrome finish. Higher standards in plating techniques were set to provide a chrome trim that would last unblemished for years. Hand-fitted leather goes into interiors of every car. Not just the prototypes, but every Continental made goes out for a severe road test. And the results of the test will be checked down to the performance of every bolt. So this is the way it happened. Over a period of more than four years, the concept of modern formal styling came to life. Growing from rough designers, engineers, and stylist sketches to a specially designed plant. And with it, new products, new jobs, carrying on a tradition, a tradition of progress. And here, tradition is brought forward ready for tomorrow. It was a challenge they offered these men, who in 1952 set out to capture the best traditions of an American classic, the Continental. And today, they find tomorrow is still ahead of them. Continental Mark II is finished, but the job of keeping it ahead is the challenge for the future. <laughs>